everyone. Welcome to our class today. We're continuing in this prophetic book written by a young Jewish man living in Jerusalem about 500 BCE as he writes to his people, some who were living there in Judah and others who were still living back in Babylon. To each of those groups, he has some clear words, and I trust that those words he spoke 2,500 years ago will speak to you and to me as we will consider what God meant as he used that young man and we'll try to learn what God has to say to us as 21st century people. As usual, my method will take us through the chapter every Friday morning and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions in the last half hour. If you're watching this teaching on YouTube after our class, feel free to write me if you have some queries. Uh, uh, bob at jewsforjesus.org.au. I'll try to answer if I'm able. If you don't already receive the email invitations to join this class live, please enter your email address just now, type it in the chat box, or write to the office admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and ask to be invited. We love to invite you, that's for sure. Also, if you don't mind, please read the chapter before you come to the class live. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can just pause your playback now, read chapter four of Zechariah, and then rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. Let's jump in. Again, the new chapter has an unusual vision. This is vision number five in this series of eight visions, all at the beginning of the prophecy of Zechariah. Last week, we turned from the work of the rebuilding of the temple to a person and to sin and to cleansing. Today, we return to the theme of the temple, but we have two unusual changes to the setting. The vision may happen at night, but an angel is actually awakening Zachariah as if from a deep sleep. And secondly, again, we zoom in on a person the governor, Zerubbabel. We learn about his person from 1 Chronicles and from the book of Haggai. I'll give you some references as we give a bit of backdrop. He was the grandson of King Jehoiakim, the son of Padiah, and for a while the leader of the first returning group of exiles. So along with the task of temple reconstruction, we note the ministry and character of Governor Zerubbabel. Since Zerubbabel was the grandson of King Jehoiakim of Judah, he was obviously in the line of King David. That will be a significant topic and point of convo later on as we consider messianic hope. Zerubbabel was born over in, Ab in Babylon during the exile sometime after 586 BCE, obviously, and he made his way over to Judah after King Cyrus II allowed the Judean captives to return to their homeland to begin to rebuild the temple. You see that in Ezra 1, Ezra 6, and in chapters 8 through 10. The prophet Haggai identifies Zerubbabel as the governor of Judah after the exile. A little more about this man and a reflection of the times and then some history of the building. His name, Zerubbabel, is a Babylonian combination name that means offspring of Babylon. That helps me remember the prophecy we've studied in Jeremiah, who encouraged Judeans when they went to Babylon to make a new life there, live there, seek the welfare of the city there, plant trees, grow, let your kids get married there. So in other words, have children of Babylon. So whether it was Padiah or later his name or his brother's name, Shealtiel, whichever was his biological father, gave Zerubbabel a Babylonian name. Think about the changes in Jewish culture when Jewish people came from Eastern Europe over to America or here in Australia, when they left shtetl life for hundreds of years, and then they gave their boys names uh, to represent, obviously, Menachem, Reuven, uh, Moishala, Irving, Louis, Harold, whatever, 
and they came to the 20th century when men were given names like Robert, William, Charles, you get it? Trying to fit in, to acculturate, to be less noticeable. And in the world of Babylon in those days, it was a way of being normal as well. Then Zerubbabel and the other exiles left Babylon about a year later, and that they got settled, that you have to do that. And those Jewish people then who were there in that first returnees uh, began to rebuild the temple. But it wasn't long before opposition arose from local adversaries. And you can read those uh, allegations in Ezra chapter four. You have to wonder why, if it's true, the Judeans chose to build without the help of any others around, who it looks like put up their hand and said, we'll help you. Well, the work was brought to a standstill by the order of King Artaxerxes, and only the foundation of the temple had been completed. The locals had sent a letter of defamation about the Jews. Artaxerxes believed that the Jews would be trouble, they wouldn't pay their taxes to him, and uh, they'd stay apart from the locals. Well, all right, the, self, the, the foundation was complete, but it was lesser. That is, it showed that this new temple was going to be much smaller than the first temple built by Solomon. This brought significant disappointment to some of the older folks who remembered what the former temple looked like. This from Ezra 3. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. Rashi, the, the great medieval Jewish interpreter of scripture, said, although the foundation was a disappointing experience for those who remembered the magnificence of the first temple, eventually, and where he gets this, I don't know, the building would be seven times more imposing than it is now. The prophet Haggai addressed their disappointment. He said this in Haggai chapter two, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, God says, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 2, in today's passage, told the people not to despise the day of small things, because God had great plans for this new temple. Finally, after a 17-year work stoppage under the next king of Persia, his name Darius, we already saw his name, the Jewish people were then granted permission to get back to rebuilding. And within three and a half years after the second effort began, the second temple was completed in 516 BCE. It sounds like 70 years almost to the date since the exile. Well, in this vision today, Zechariah receives words that should have encouraged Zerubbabel. In chapter 4, verse 6 and following, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll be like a plain. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of grace, grace, then the word of the Lord came to me, the hand of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you'll know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. As a descendant of King David, Zerubbabel was identified with the coming Messiah by contemporary prophets Haggai and Zechariah. The Jewish people began to see Zerubbabel as their great hope for reviving the Davidic kingship and for liberation from the Persians. Rashi said that God had chosen Zerubbabel from all the people of the world as the one fit to execute this task. The prophet Haggai declared that God would use Zerubbabel to overthrow and destroy kingdoms. 
The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. This is Haggai 2. Um, on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I've chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Well, with all that as background and a shadow of foreground, let's unpack the few verses that are chapter 4 of Zechariah, of Zechariah. Verse 1. The angel almost shakes Zechariah, <laughs> wake up, which makes sense in light of Haggai chapter 2 and the shaking that God intended through him. Verse 2, the angel asks, what do you see? And Zechariah runs a catalog. He mentions the menorah, but it's different. It's got seven feeder tubes in each of the seven branches. That's 49 tubes altogether and a bowl on top where these 49 come from. And that's not how the original was looking when it was built back in the days of Moses in Exodus 25. Then verse three, we read of two olive trees, one on either side. We're gonna see them at the end of the story as well. All right, well, that's not too far-fetched. You need the olive trees to produce the olives that are then squeezed and create the oil that goes in the bowl, that goes through the tubes, that lights the menorah. Verse 4, a simple question. It's reasonable. Zachariah says, what are these, Lord? Uh, you'd expect the angel to explain, <laughs> but he doesn't. Verse 5, he says, don't you know? What, what? How come you don't know this? Almost like you're, you're the governor, you're, you don't know these things? It's, I think, a mocking question, and obviously Zechariah didn't know, or why would he have asked? I am so glad the Almighty doesn't treat us in this way. When we lack wisdom, the Apostle James says, we should ask of God, who gives to all men liberally without upbraiding us. He doesn't chide us and say, dummy, you should know this. Verse 6. This is the first explanation in this chapter. This is God's word to Zerubbabel. Your work, God says to him, will not be by human strength or enterprise, not in human wisdom, not in your capacities, not because you've got an earned PhD from Sydney Uni. It's God's work and he will ensure it's done in his power. That's comforting. Look, tonight we have a soft launch and tomorrow evening the actual opening night for our art exhibition here in Sydney's East in Darlinghurst in Taylor Square. It has been a huge undertaking to ready this, costing us tens of thousands of dollars and we have high hopes for this month-long exhibition. I'll tell you more about it in the question time. But for my staff on this call today, and for you who are listening and watching, know this. We're not doing this in our human cleverness or wisdom, not by human might or power, but by God's spirit. That's how Zerubbabel was to build the temple, not trusting in his own capacity or the military might of the Jewish people, but trusting the Lord to make things happen in his timing and in his strength. Verse 7, what can withstand us? <laughs> Har Hagadol, a, a, a Gadol mountain, a great mountain, a mighty mountain. Ha! You can almost hear, almost hear the angel say, that's nothing. And it actually sounds like Yeshua talking about a grain of mustard seed faith. You can move mountains, mountains of troubles, and boy, oh boy, did did the returnees, uh, these exiles coming back home to Jerusalem, have plenty of troubles. I mean, everything's broken. They've been gone seven decades. Uh, everything, nothing's the way it was. Where's, the, where's Irving's uh, grocery store? It's gone. It's in the rubble. Where, is, uh, where are the plants? 
I mean, everything we had, it's there, it's all gone. It's not one year of Jubilee left fallow every seven years. No, this is, this is decimation. Everything's ruined. We're out of the comfort of Babylon. We're now back in our land, but it's hard work. What, do, what are we doing here? It's almost like the returnees who came back to Israel as Chalutzim, as the pioneers who came back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, back when uh, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, when Jewish people were beginning pioneering back in the land. There was nothing there. It was a devastated place. Why are we there? Well, the angel says you can move mountains of troubles even of leftover fallen ruins of the first temple. All that leftover stuff, what does he say? It'll be like a plain. And God will make the capstone, this keystone, this Evan Harosha, Rosh, head, Evan, stone, this main stone, he's gonna make it to come out and fulfill its mission. Look, a, a capstone is the final stone of a building project. It's the last thing you put in, think of a, a keystone in a bridge. Uh, you, you build from one side and, and then the other, both at the same time. Then the final piece, right there. That's the capstone, that's the top stone. It's the culmination of all that hard work. God says he will bring it out and there will be shouts of chen, chen, grace, grace. I love it when the Bible repeats. I love it when the Bible repeats so that we, so that we get it. Double grace, all the grace a man needs, all the grace a people need, all the grace you will ever need is found in doing what God says and he will bring in the supply and make sure that that bridge holds together, that building holds together. You will finish it, Zerubbabel. Verse eight, more interpretation follows. The angel says some further words. Verse nine, Zerubbabel started this. He will be the one to finish it. It's not a relay race, but with baton to baton to baton to different runners, it's gonna happen in a season, not over many lifetimes, it'll get done. Verse 10, don't knock the beginnings. Small things are not to be despised. We have to start somewhere. You'll get it done. That's a comfort to those who are builders. It's a comfort to those of us who are employed in the work of God. Don't knock the beginnings. And how long are beginnings anyway? I mean, do we know how long a beginning is? Is it one year? Is it one month? Is, we don't know. So you turn around and you look and you say, that's all we've got. We've been working so hard for these many years, months, days, whatever, and that's it. Don't knock it. Small things are not to be despised. Then what does it say? These seven, these seven, what seven? We haven't had a seven except for the menorahs. Uh, it's not talking about those seven. It's from chapter three, talking about the seven eyes or the seven facets they'll be glad when they see my version says the plumb line now a plumb line you know is a item that you use in wallpapering to make sure everything's square on my phone in the art exhibition i've got a, a an app that's a level and i could put it on top of every painting and make sure that it's not askew and i could make sure that it's nice and level in the old days you'd actually have a tool called a level but there's an app for that. But this is not the word for plumb line. I don't know why they use the word plumb. The Hebrew is not plumb, but rather uh, bedil. It says, uh, et ha'even ha'bedil. The bedil is, is the root word, is the root of the word hamavdil, uh, to separate, even the word havdala on Saturday night. That's the divide between secular and holy, that's a common theme throughout the Bible, the dividing line, the line that separates. And God wants his people to have his temple to honor him. He's divided it. 
We need to be on, if you will, his team. And then it says, the eyes range to and fro. That, that just gave me so many reminders of biblical use of God's eyes. I was thinking about it last week and again this week. In 2 Chronicles, we read, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You've acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. So the, the, this in 2 Chronicles 16 says that God's moving, looking all around. He's checking, he's checking up on his creation. I don't know if you have a boss. I was in uh, KFC, was it yesterday, uh, with, with one of the fellows on the call, and we were, we were eating together. And uh, I kept looking at one of the, she, I, she must have been the manager of the KFC, and there she was walking around. She was filling up the, the, the Coca-Cola machine with all kinds of other products and making sure this is done. But then she had a controversy with one of the guys and she told him what he could be doing. Uh, you remember the, the old movie with David Spade, if you can lean it, if you got time to lean, you got time to clean. And that's what it felt like she was doing uh, with, with this fellow. Her eyes were all over the shop, making sure things were done. That's my picture that I get from two Chronicles. And in the Proverbs, we read this, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. See, God's eyes are on duty all day long, all month long, all your lifetime. Verses 11 to 14, there are two olive trees. What are they? Well, not what, but it's a who. These are the two anointed ones, not the Hebrew word mashach, like Messiah, but rather tzahar. These are the two anointed ones who are standing and awaiting God's words to fulfill. They're loyal attendants, ready to serve. They are Joshua and Zerubbabel. And it's like in Revelation 11, where some of you will know that there are two witnesses at the end. Don't expect two particular folks. In fact, it's not even the real number at the last, but rather it's a symbol of the same history. It's a call to you and to me and to anyone on this call and anyone we call and say, please join us to stand at the ready to serve our great God and that he might be called Lord of all the earth. Al Adon Kol Haaretz. Adon, Lord over Kol Haaretz. Not just the Jewish land, but over all the earth. We will see that going forward in this book even next week. But get that in your head and deep in your kishkas, if you will. He will be using two witnesses to bring his love and grace to the whole earth. Remember the quote from Haggai said something about a signet ring? That was in chapter 2. As a seal of royal authority, the signet ring is a messianic metaphor. Jeremiah used it in chapter 22 of his prophecy, and he said, if Jehoiakim, remember that's Zerubbabel's granddaddy, were his signet ring, God would cast him off. He, he was troubled by Jehoiakim. Thus Haggai was saying that through Zerubbabel, God would reverse the curse he had personally pronounced on Jehoiakim. God would place the wicked king's grandson like a signet ring on his own finger. Likewise, the words on that day point to a future messianic fulfillment of Haggai's message. Although Zerubbabel's temple was smaller than the one Solomon built, God promised a greater glory. In Haggai 2, we read, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. The glory bestowed on Zerubbabel's temple came centuries later, when Yeshua, our Messiah, came into the temple courts. The Messiah never visited Solomon's temple, but Zerubbabel's temple, he did. I find it strange then that before the second temple was completed and dedicated, 
We don't see Zerubbabel anymore. His name disappears from the biblical record. It's possible that Zerubbabel may have returned to Babylon soon after finishing his work on the temple, or it could be that the Persians feared a Jewish uprising. We see that hinted at, not sure. Or it could be that the, this Jewish uprising, they would have had Zerubbabel removed or executed. Regardless, Zerubbabel is revered as one of the Bible's great heroes, working to reconstruct the Lord's house of worship, and he's even listed in the genealogy of Yeshua. Do you know that? In Matthew chapter 1, we read, After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel's the father of Abihud, Abihud the father of Eliakim, and it goes on. While the temple Zerubbabel helped rebuild was nothing compared to the size and the grandeur, the glory of Solomon's, it far outlasted it. In fact, Zerubbabel's temple was still standing 500 years later when the promised Messiah filled it full. And now we live in an age when Messiah, the despised and rejected one, is trying to be known in the whole earth yet again. Our role as believers is to carry that message, to stand at the ready until he charges us and equips us, and then to go lift him up so that all people will be drawn to himself. Amen. Remember, you who are watching today, if you're not yet a follower of Yeshua and see his love for you, his kindness extended, his offer of forgiveness available right where you are, Submit to him, to his lordship, to his care, and your life will take on new meaning, new substance, and you'll have mates on this call and in your neighborhood and wherever you travel. The kingdom is advancing under the king. Chaos is subjugated. Life is available. Would you like that? If you've never prayed, just right where you are, pray these words. Pray words in your own Pray your own words if you'd like. Let me just give you a sample. Father, forgive me in Yeshua's name. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to get to know you through Zechariah chapter 4 and through this call and this YouTube. I don't deserve it, yet you're a God who's kind and yells grace, grace all over me. And I receive that grace, not because I deserve it, but because you're lavish in extending grace to us. Thanks for that. Make me born again in Yeshua's name. If you prayed that, just write to us, would you? Admin at jewsforjesus.org.au and we'll get you some literature. We'll pray with you. We'd love to be part of your life today and throughout your days. I wish you a Shabbat Shalom.